to keep on top of your finances so you can sleep at night. So um, my company is Wellington Consulting and um, my name is Penny Lowe. So the agenda for this time slot is to start off with introductions, then why do you need to keep on top of your finances, what you must do, what you can do and what to do next. So introductions, as I said my name is Penny Lowe, I've been in business now for 10 years on my own. So from a business point of view, I can honestly say that I've uh, been there, done that, including even being an accountant, making some of the errors that I would then guide you away from to make sure you don't fall into the same traps. Um, my company is not only an accountancy practice, but also works with businesses as a business mentor and educating the business owner about their finances. I'm quite a small company and I do a lot of work with small companies from start-up through to a few hundred staff. I'm happy to work with larger companies as well and what I do there is more on the education side to go in and teach their managers and their other directors about the accounts. So, I'm an accountant trainer and coach and mentor. Um, we've asked you to sign the register the reason for that being that we're going to have a draw for a copy of my book, my book, at the end of the session. So, yourselves, may I ask, as it's such a small and uh, elite audience, as to whether you're already in business? So, have you? Yeah, we're looking for a new enterprise at the moment. We have been in business before. And how about yourself? Yeah, I've just gone uh, and launched a small trade of this year. I've got two businesses. Good. Totally at the start. So, you know, I'm managing my own finance for the first time. Just giving it a good go, ready to learn. Yeah, so that's what we like. People coming along to learn. Yeah. Because it's one of those things very different between teaching and learning. So, by what we're standing here spouting out, there is. Uh, suggestions but it all comes down to putting it into action rather than just listening to it. So, why do it? Why keep on top of your finances? When you start off in business it's very easy to spend out on what you think is necessary without looking at the returns for that particular um, expenditure. Simple example being the exhibition here. Yeah, it costs a lot of money to come to Olympia for an exhibition. It's not just the uh, cost of the stand, but it's getting the stand ready and the time when you're not doing other work. There's quite a lot of costs involved. And for a lot of small businesses, they will be approached by a lot of marketing companies to promote their business. But unless they're clear on what their message is, will they actually be getting value for money in that marketing money that they spend? So marketing is just one area where it's easy to spend money without even considering what the returns might be. Another reason for keeping on top of the finances is knowing what's coming up next. And that may just be the phone bill at the end of the month. Or it may be the tax bill at the end of the year. And that is a big area where a lot of people will forget that they've got to put money aside in order to fund the tax bill at the end of the year. Another reason for keeping an eye on the finances is a lot of people say, you know, I'm making a profit or I'm breaking even, but how much in their own time are they building into that cost? Are they actually charging themselves out at the same cost that they would need to employ somebody? if they were to go off and build the business rather than actually produce it for the business. So those are some of the areas where it's easy to forget and why you need to actually look at the figures. The other one, of course, being make sure you've got money in the bank to pay the bills. Otherwise, will your business carry on? Unlikely. Part of the looking whether you've got money in the bank is 
whether the customers have actually paid you, whether they've paid you on time, the right amount, and whether what they're paying for is actually what they're getting. And what I mean by that, particularly in a startup or a small business, it's very easy to over deliver. That might make the customers happy, but it doesn't do your bank balance any good if you're spending twice as much time providing for them a good service far beyond what you originally agreed to provide. It's those sorts of traps that you can easily fall into and why you need to keep an eye on it. As an accountant, it's reasonably easy for me to say those sorts of things because I keep a timesheet. I don't tend to offer a flat rate for my work. I charge people by the hour and I keep a record of that hour so I can sit down at the end of the week and see how much I need to bill people. But just important, as importantly, I have a client called Wellington, my own company, so when I am doing work for my own company, I also record that time. And it's very easy to spend two hours going through emails, and that two hours is not charged to any one client, and you know, that's two hours your company now has charged to clients. And the other hint, if you are starting to record time, is another client I have is wife and mother, where when husband says, as you're at home, can you just? And that can consume quite a lot of chargeable time. So to be able to look at the end of the week and say, how many hours have I spent working on or in the business? How many hours do I think I've spent? You can then see quite easily and start to work out how much time and how much you're paying yourself per hour. Please don't be frightened by how low it might be, particularly in the startup position. So, there are some reasons why you might choose to keep an eye on the figures. Others are empty pockets. Yeah, you have got to pay Tesco because they don't give credit where you might have a credit card. Um, you've got to pay that credit card at some point. You have got to have money to pay not only your personal bills but your supplier bills as well. And the other thing that a lot of small businesses don't appreciate is there can be a lot of tension involved if you have money worries. Can you stand there being jolly and um, very helpful to a client if all the time you're worrying how you're going to pay your salaries at the end of the week? And I say salaries, in small business it might just be paying yourself. You might have a mortgage or rent to pay. So it can be quite a um, headache maybe running your own business if you don't keep an eye on those figures. Do. Gather your figures, and by that I don't just mean put them in a cardboard box ready to send off to the accountant. Yes, by all means put them in a cardboard box, but once a week take them out and actually summarise them. Depending on the size of your business as to how you might summarise them, it might be a spreadsheet, it might be a programme such as QuickBooks or Sage. It depends what is appropriate to your business as to how you actually log those figures. But in the same way, looking at your bank statement. The other day I had a phone call from my bank at NatWest, from NatWest, to say that my card had been compromised when I confirmed the payments made the day before. And they had got three payments that I didn't recognise. So they immediately froze the card. But, you know, if it wasn't with that West, if I didn't know what I paid the day before, one wonders how much would have been taken out of my account. And that's a business account for a limited company. And I am pretty careful about what I do put through. So, gathering your figures, and as I say, looking at your figures, just if you think you know what's in the bank, has a client's check bounced that have made the payment and it's that being returned by the bank? Or has an annual payment gone out that you've forgotten about? Almost happened to me, I'm a member of the Chamber of Commerce. So they sent the direct debit through going, this is your renewal month, we'd like £277 out in the next five days. Come on, you have to remember about things like that. It's on direct debit, they're perfectly entitled to take it out, but what else have you got that money assigned for? So another reason to look at your figures. It's all very well leaving it to your accountant. Yes, they're going to keep up to date with tax. They're going to keep up to date with VAT and payroll taxes and things like that. 
but you've got to be able to talk to the accountant and the day-to-day -day cash flow is going to be down to you, even if you've got a bookkeeper, because I've seen bookkeepers who, as soon as the bill comes in, pay it. If you know you've got a big bill coming up, it may be that you want to take advantage of 30-day credit or something like that to help you stretch the money you have got as long as it will go so that you can have other customers pay you and you can pay that bill easily rather than using the money straight away. So looking at figures but most importantly acting on what you find. It's all very well as I said right at the start, gathering things together and uh, you know, saying yes, yes I do my accounts. But if you don't actually look at them and act on what you find, you may find yourself in the ground smelly stuff. And that's not necessarily where you want to be. So, that's what you must do. What you should do is make sure that your figures are up to date. That's important, because if you're looking at out-of-date figures, you won't know what the current position is. But they're accurate. Have you actually put an entry in that says £15.99? But actually it was £159.90 p. Easily done. We all end up in finger trouble sometimes. So making sure that they are accurate. And last of all, in a form that you can understand, putting figures into QuickBooks or some of the other accounting packages is all very well. But do you understand which reports are going to be the most benefit to your business? And that's where possibly we can help by sitting down with you, deciding what figures to get out from your business and what they actually mean. So in a form that you understand. So, what you can do is to put time aside for finance. Not many people do. Some longer established businesses will say, I always do my finances on a Saturday morning. That's fine, because they regularly do their, business, their finances on a Saturday morning. One of my clients said he finds it so much easier now. Thursday, he gets somebody in to work in his shop and he spends Thursday doing admin. He says he's so much more productive doing it at home than trying to do it about customers coming into the shop. So he's found the benefit. We've sat down, looked at what the courts, and he's happy now. He knows what direction the business is going, what's profitable and what's not profitable. So, that was finding time. So, get help or delegate lower level tasks. When I say delegate, that could be to a bookkeeper, it could be to a spouse, it could be to a teenage offspring. They can all be trained up to simply sit there, and my daughter's quite good at it now, uh, and sit there, go through the bills, and put them in date order or put them which ones were paid cash, which ones were paid um, through the business account. Show them where to look where the credit card number is and they'll know which account cards are put it in. It's simple things like that that you can get help with. Um, a slight aside that um, my daughter, who is now age 25, was brought up having to do things like this for me and managed to avoid accounts for many, many years until last year she took a job, a part-time job in an HR department, inputting data. When she got there, she phoned me the first night and said, Mum, it's an accounts department, I've spent the day inputting expense invoices. So, and having said that, she smiles as well, because she's still there. And October was a year that she's been there. So, you know, whatever age you can start them. Because one of the other tricks that some accountants will tell you, others will forget to tell you, is that it's perfectly legitimate to employ your offspring, providing you can justify that they're actually doing work for you. The benefit of this is it's going to reduce your tax bill, because you've got an expense for wages, which is legitimate, and it's going to a junior, so um, they won't have a national insurance number, you won't have to record, you have to record it, but not actually notify the tax office as such. Um, so you can have a reduction in your tax bill by paying your um, offspring, if you have any, to input some of the figures for you. So, getting help or delegating. As your business grows, you know, it may be that you have a bookkeeper or something like that. 
there's plenty of part-time bookkeepers around um, um, all sorts of ages and there is a website called Binkley's where you have retired people who have done it for years and know exactly what they're doing and they're looking for part-time work. So that sort of thing, you can often bring in somebody with a lot of experience at not too much cost. And the last thing that you can do is learn which numbers are important and why. By not producing the numbers, yes, the taxman wants them, but you as a business owner can make use of them. We all serve the internet for information, but you actually look at your account for information in the same way. The difference is that the accounts are personal to you. Information on the internet tends to be very general. Your accounts can tell you what direction you're going, what the trends are, which jobs are more profitable, and if you need help with that, Again, you can get help from somebody who's prepared to sit down with you and decide what information you need and what it means. So one option for keeping on top of the figures or making sure you've got some money might be to break into a bank, but I wouldn't recommend it. Because in the same way as tax evasion, you can end up with a prison sentence. You don't really want to do that. So, alternatively, you could create a list of regular monthly payments. Prepare a list of how much money you owe and when it is due. Prepare a list of how much you are owed and also when you are expecting people to pay you and to make sure they have no excuse not to pay you, by like phoning them up in advance and just making sure they're happy with everything. Prepare a monthly profit and loss account follow trends so that you can see whether some months are doing better than others or whether you have a seasonal approach to your business and create an action plan of how you're actually going to review the figures because without action creating figures is no good you've actually got to act on those figures the way I approach things is actually taking things seriously and not just talking in general terms. So what I did when I was preparing these slides is actually go through my bank statement for the last month and here are my actual figures for the last month. For the sake of my staff, you'll notice I put X's against salaries at the bottom. So excluding salaries, rent and other outgoings, the other items are all direct debits or standing orders I have going out of my account. So I have the landline. I have bank charges because I've been in business more than a year and I don't get free banking. I get help posting my blogs. I have insurance to pay and as an accountant my insurance works out quite a lot per year but I have to accept that. There is subscriptions per month. My mobile phone bill. The networking group that I go to each month. My contact management system. CRM being customer relationship management. I have an online system which not only helps me manage my customers but also keeps me in contact and I can do my emailing from that. Social networking help. Because as an accountant, there's a limit as to how much I know on that front or how much time it is worth me spending. In a month, how many hours of accountancy work do I need to do to easily cover that cost? And just as a hint, I use the same excuses for hiring a cleaner at home, so I work from home. But I can pay a cleaner for two and a half hours' work as much as, well, I can earn more in that than I pay her for two and a half hours a week. So, you know, it's an easy judgment for me. Anyway, cleaner's not down here. Uh, the answer service I use. Uh, webinar software, because as well as presentations like this and on the stand, I do a variety of webinars. I have a Frankie machine, because that stops me queuing at the post office. Mobile internet access for when I'm out and about. IT support, I have a very good firm that I can phone up and go, help, something's not working. And they can dial it and help me set up on that. Uh, various software I use and the monthly payment for that. So, the biggest figure there is the 240, but that adds up to £1,235.46. And that's without staff salaries, rents and other outgoings. So it's quite easy 
to actually see for me how much I need to earn every month as a minimum. And that's before profit, that's before salaries. So it does frighten people sometimes how quickly it adds up. But that tends to be my approach. I would rather show you actual figures. And you go, oh, I don't have that, I don't have that, that's fine. Because it is a conscious decision that you have not included it on your list. Talking generalities is all very well. But, you know, you go back home and you go, oh yeah, we have three things going out each month. No, look at your bank statement and see how many you have actually got going out. Do the same exercise and don't be frightened by the answer. Just sell a bit more. So, really it boils down to planning. Planning when you're going to have your figures ready for review. Plan when you're going to learn how to interpret them. And plan who is going to help you. Because you can't do this alone, unless you're in accountancy practice, in which case, welcome to the seminar. I hope you already know everything I've said so far. It does help to, to get help, in the same way I do with the social media stuff, blogging stuff. I don't expect to be an expert at everything. I know when I need to get help. Same with the IT. So, part of what we said about the future is what's your finance improve? By monitoring it, you're going to be much more conscious of your expenditure. I had somebody come and help me, or well, volunteer to help me on my stand, a friend of mine. And he said, are you staying over? And I said, no. Why not? You can just put it through the books. Yeah, but it eats into my profit, and it's not just the cost of the hotel, it's the cost of the evening meal in town, and the breakfast in town, versus the cost of the train fare back home and back in tomorrow morning. So all the time I'm thinking about money. So, talking of money, there are free things about as well. There is lots of free information on the internet, but as I mentioned, it is not necessarily appropriate for your business, and that's why you need the help so you know how to interpret some of that free information. Having said that, I've got a couple of seminars, uh, webinars coming up this coming Tuesday. The first one for business startups, primarily. Five business, uh, okay, five big mistakes new business owners make and how to avoid them. And for existing businesses, or also for new businesses, seven reasons why you must look at your accounts. Now these have got an interactive element to them, so we can actually ask questions specific on, at the time. And I often do that with some of my smaller webinars, but we actually have the opportunity for a chat so people can learn from each other as well as uh, my presentations. So what I'd like you to do is invite you to join those. We have got to register somewhere and there's a few people who weren't here right at the start. Is there a chance we can pass that around? Because what that will allow me to do is email to you the link for the webinars, but also introduce you into a feed draw. Sorry, what is a webinar? Right, the webinar will be a link using GoToWebinar where you can sit in front of your computer and have a presentation similar to this. The difference is if you've just got home from work, it doesn't matter you know, that you're in your slippers and everything else or nipping out every so often to keep an eye on the potatoes because you're trying to cook supper. Um, because it is a presentation. It'll be approximately um, between 45 minutes and an hour long. And what I usually do is if people have signed up for it and aren't able to attend, I make the content available. So if you're, for example, still in employment and starting up, it means if you sign up for it and can't attend, once you're home from work, you can then actually listen to the presentation. So, the idea of the webinar is to share information, help you build your businesses, because what we want to do is make sure that everybody who starts in business is actually a success. At the moment, they reckon that about a third of the businesses that start up do not last two years. Half of them are gone within four years. If you're putting the time, effort and money into starting a business, you want to make sure that you have the returns from that. So it's in everybody's interest to make sure that it's a success. Certainly from my point of view, I've been in business for a long time and therefore 
want other businesses to succeed and also be able to celebrate their 10th birthday. So the title of this seminar was, uh, I refer back to my first page, uh, how to keep on top of your finances so that you can sleep at night. So what we'd like to do, this isn't quite the end, that is to think of sweet dreams. What you want to do is have a peaceful sleep so that you're fresh to make lots of money the next day. Lying in bed fretting about your finances is not good for your health. So instead of counting sheep, you'll be able to be counting pounds coming into your bank account. But when you're lying in bed, that's what you should be thinking about is the money flowing in rather than fretting about how it's flowing out. So what I'd like to do, just while I wait for the register to finish going around, is ask if there's any questions and then I'll be able to do the draw. So, are there any questions? <laughs>